Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to RT Machine Podcast. We're on episode eight. We have uh, quite a bit of info to go over today, and uh, we have some hot news. Which, right off the presses, right? Hot off hot the presses. Off the, presses. Uh, the boys at Green Street Joinery, Jeff and Rob, were the winners of the Strebig vertical panel saw. Hey, now. Yeah. Have a round of applause. Pause. Everybody. Hey. <laughs> Yeah, it was pretty exciting. Hey, I got the phone call yesterday, and uh, they were like, you're not going to believe this. I had goosebumps. It was pretty awesome. That is awesome. It was cool to see them guys get it. They they did a good job of with their uh, videos and everything that uh, plugged away to, to actually win the win the saw, so it was... Oh, the beauty of it is they'll keep promoting it, too. Yeah. So it's awesome for Streebeek as well. Yeah, with, with all their video stuff that they do and what we do, it's going to be uh, great promotional, I think, all the way around, and really help those guys out as a shop and uh that's what kind of promoted our uh today's show of talking about saws and panel processing with saws and uh, we do have a guest though from our service department today we have brianna she schedules people to fix the saws yeah i try my best yeah you do a very good job <laughs> thank you why don't you give us a little more background on what you do there brianna Sure. So I started at RT as the marketing coordinator for RT Machine Service. That was until December of 2022 when they had asked me to come on board full time to schedule their service technicians as well as do truck dispatching. I still do a little bit of the marketing, but we let Amanda handle a lot of it. So you started out, you were part time with another company and part time, but you're 100% with us right now. Correct. So I started out 20 hours a week for RT Machine Service and 20 hours a week for Blue Tech in Mechanicsburg, which does IT. Um, I'm not exactly sure what came to the decision of bringing me on full time, but they asked me in December if I'd be willing to switch roles a little bit, and here we are. Nice. What did you do before you came to us? So I had gone to Law Haven for marketing. I got a degree in marketing and the pandemic hit, so I ended up managing storage units being an operations manager, renting out units, oh, dispatching right. our mobile mm -hmm. trucks. Nice. Yeah. Well, we're glad to have you. You did a great job for us. Well, thank you. Keep the boys in line. That's yeah, it. Sure that's, that's a tough, I'm tall sure order on that one. Easier said than easy. done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, bad. most of the guys are fantastic. All of the guys are fantastic. Derek's executive assistant. That is my title. <laughs> <laughs> so you take the calls from customers needing service. Yep, I take all the calls. I filter through anything Derek asked me to. Sometimes we reach out to old customers that we haven't heard from in a while. And the salesmen also send me some leads of people that they've talked to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you keep a nice list with, with my customers of what we've been uh, working on and what we can fix, what we can't fix, and possibly move into a new piece of equipment if it's worn out its uh, duty cycle. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. That's fantastic. So, yeah, what we thought we would do today is... Start on uh, saws from the bottom side and uh, take us up through um, the different styles of saws. Uh, obviously, our brands that we carry and um, some of the differences. And uh, basically what we're going to do is like our, our topic for each saw will be, you know, the safety aspect, uh, efficiency and in, in production, cutting with them, you know, operator fatigue and uh, accuracy, squaring you know, of your uh, product coming off and uh, where to, when to upgrade and uh, set up in maintenance, you know, as through the life of the saw and, and daily or weekly uh, style maintenance or calibrations. And uh, Ryan, do you want to kick off with the uh, saw stop? Yeah. So saw stop, we recently uh, started carrying their products. Um, very good uh, technology they're using to help save fingers. That uh, they're running anywhere from a construction site mobile saw up to an industrial table saw. Typically, we're seeing one of these saws in almost every shop, whether it's a big production shop that they're using for packaging in the back or just a small one, two man shop getting started. Yeah, um, I don't think those ever go away. Yeah, so this, what you're saying, though, this people that have a Powermatic, what people would know as a Powermatic uh, 
table saw or a delta unisaw would upgrade yep. to a saw stop for safety. Yes, that's where that's where saw stop is starting to get picking up is that upgrade for the safety reasons. Yep. So those that have a standard table saw are going to be struggle a little bit with the accuracy because they're dragging their panel across. I mean, you can probably talk about that more than anybody, Brian. You've operated these things more than us. Yeah, I mean, that's where you're going to be. You're, uh, a lot of the operation is hinging on that operator. You know, the operator is who's going to be given that the most part of the accuracy of just managing that panel through the saw. Obviously, as the panels get smaller, it's much easier. Um, or what we would call walk out off of the fence. Itself. Dragging it past the fence. Yeah. Right. Now, I get into a lot of shops, and I see tables and different uh, support systems built around the saw. Is that mainly just for helping to support the panels? Correct. Yeah, When you most of this stuff, when you have all your outfeed tables, and some guys even add a smaller infeed table as well to help manage, you know, a 4 by 8 panel or... Or if you got to even go up to a five by five by nine or five by ten panel, that's, that's got to be quite a thing to yeah, push that through. There. It's almost three yeah. people to run through yeah. a standard table saw, right? So it's definitely uh, you know, but it's still the staple of the shops, you know. So and I don't think no matter till you go up into you know uh, big beam saws, uh, you know your sliding table saw verticals um, on that side of it, I think the small table saw always stays within the mix and. Uh, you know, it's really where on the safety side of it with the saw stop, you know, obviously we still sell, you know, the standard uh, table saws yep. as well without the safety features on it. Right. So like North Tech has a table saw that you're going to get a little bit cheaper price, but you're not going to have the safety systems with like a saw stop. Um, so you want. Right. So you might have some applications where somebody would go into like a North Tech with a heavier horsepower, um, heavier base machine that's trying to bridge the gap between uh, a straight line rip style saw and just having the horsepower to go through a regular table saw. When and back I, in the old days, we had the Tanowitz and uh, Northfields, uh, eighteen inch <laughs> blades, uh, the so, cast iron table saws. We can't even give them away anymore. But yeah, they've definitely. Uh, move towards that. And I think a lot of the industry almost all the way across the board is shifting towards the safety aspects is uh, what's really driving that saw stop, you know, because it is probably the number one amputee causing piece of yeah. equipment in the shop for sure. So what do you think a guy would want to upgrade from a, a small shop that would have a slider or I mean a standard table saw? When would he go up to a slider? I think once you start looking at uh, how many panels you're starting to process and in a day and pretty much the fatigue of the operator as well. I think that's one of the biggest things that, you know, most shops overlook that uh, somebody may be purchasing in the office and they're not actually out there running the saw right. and getting that much more out of an operator into going into a different style saw. So uh, going from the typical standard table saw going into the sliding table saw is going to give you a lot more ease of operation as well. And when you're going into that, you can start with just basically the manual fences and then we can go all the way into fully automated downloadable sliding panel saw. So the big thing is depending on what you're trying to do with, with your saw in that operation, um, are you still doing a lot of custom cutting you know, 45 cuts, miter cuts, things like that on the slider. That's where your advantages are coming in with your sliding table saw. Um, <clears throat> but then what what I see quite often is um, people are starting to get into like Green Street. They're doing a lot more panel processing. And, you know, still when you're getting into cutting a lot of sheets on the sliding table saw, there's still the fatigue of the operator. And that's where... You know, we where the vertical panel saw really takes a lot of that load off the operator within a day. You know, they they still feel refreshed after cutting twenty or thirty sheets. You know, Is, and that's mainly because you can stack <clears throat> stack sheets on like a vertical. Correct, a lot easier. Um, yeah, if you're if you're cutting, you know, say a standard cabinet job where you have a lot of your base cabinets and everything that are all the same depth. You know, now you can you're going to be cutting four six panels out of that uh, sides out of that 
now you can now you can uh, stack that as well so now you're now you can cut two or three sheets at a time on that vertical and you're no longer sliding the panels you're exactly moving the beam. so you know today's product market with all the uh, tfls with the uh, you know grained and embossed finishes you know, now now it's much easier to scratch some of these materials within the machine right. processes. So. It's getting more and more brittle. And <clears throat> yep. That. So now you're you're on the vertical panel saw to really get into the operation of that vertical. You're you're talking about the panel is stationary within the vertical part of the the carriage, and the carriage is actually moving through the panel. So you basically go into your rip cuts, and then you can actually go right into your cross cut. So an advantage with the Strebig, with the uh, 16 foot bed on the saw, which is an option, but typically is how it's brought in today. So you're able to take the four by eight panel, leave it stationed at one end of the machine, make your rip cuts. You can pull those rip cuts off and set them to the side, or you can go right into what we have as a mid fence that pulls out, and you can set your pieces to be cross cut right on that mid fence and go right into your cross cut pieces so you're not actually taking all the pieces right off the saw it's staying right on the saw till you knock it down into its actual size to be cut now when we start comparing accuracy to a slider versus a vertical are we losing some accuracy because we've moved to a beam saw or well you're going to pick up because of the vertical being uh, in, in the Strebig's case the Strebig is a highly accurate vertical panel saw they're not all in that same caliber of what the this is a precision unit where squaring and stuff is much easier um, you're not relying on the operator like you are on a sliding or a, a manual style table saw where you're actually having to drive the material through the actual blade and up against the fence so any little variation you know is what what uh, where you're picking up your accuracy so in, in that term, when you're jumping into that vertical, you know, your, your efficiency climbs way up. So your production is, is up with that. Um, obviously your safety. Just, and, and your safety is huge because now you don't have your hands anywhere near a blade because it's encapsulated into a cage and it's just dropping through the saw and your hands aren't anywhere near the, the operation of the saw blade. So that's one of your biggest features safety wise and your dust collection. Yeah. So now all your dust collection is being contained within that and it's being pulled out very well. So now your operator's not in that dusty environment. <clears throat> so even with the best sliding table saws and, and regular yeah. table saws, you know, the operator's going to eat a little more dust, sure. you know, in a day. There's just no way around it. It's, you know, it's contained pretty well, but, you know, not like the, not not like the vertical. And the machine itself does not take up very much space compared to the other options. Right. Well, that's people slam up against the wall. Yep. So your typical vertical, you know, standard uh, Strebig compact, you're going to be about six foot by about 18 foot, <clears throat> you know, against the wall between your carriage fully all, all the way out and uh, dust collection and everything. So it's it's a pretty compact compared to your sliding table saw where you're you're talking a good 12 feet from the like wall. 20. And, you know, you're talking about 12 by 20 area really that you right. need to process a panel on a sliding table saw so but by the time you build those tables all the way around your power matic or your saw stop it's yeah not, not, taking up that much more <laughs> not much different yeah so uh when we're setting a sliding table saw up versus setting like a vertical up that's we're typically seeing more time to set the verticals up and more maintenance within the verticals no, typically once your vertical is is set um, and, you know, and you're fastened to the floor, you don't really have much to go off of um, your guide rails and that. You know, basically just want to blow down and, and keep clean on a weekly basis, you know. And obviously a lot of that depends on your dust collection, you know. Like we were talking last week on planers, you know, the dust collection is huge. And, you know, it, it, so many times it's such an afterthought and just so many pieces of equipment in the shop and that's, really one of the big things you want to do is you want to have excellent dust collection just to pull that dust away from the machine away from the motors you know that they're not just buried in there or dropping it on the ground you know yeah 
So that that's what lends to even, you know, that weekly maintenance. So if you have a very good dust collection and everything's being uh, sucked away when you're operating and you're not going to have those things just laying on the saws. Yeah, and one of the things, too, on the, on the vertical, you have your bell rollers on the bottom. So you have contact points. So that's one of the other things that you, your your sawdust on the bottom can just drop away, and it's not like you're up against a a fence or on the table or something like that. So you're you're not actually working or within or laying a panel on top of sawdust to be able to scratch the panels as well. You know when you're going from a horizontal application. So and the big thing is is just trying to come up with what is your operation? Do you still need that sliding table saw in the shop? with a lot of the operations you're doing, you know, and I know, um, like green street, they're actually eliminating their sliding table saw because they have two other saw stop table saws in their shop with other capabilities. So hmm. and primarily their um, some of their oddball cutting they do, they'll do on that or on like their track saw. Yeah. Right. You'd see a lot of people would get rid of their slider once they get a vertical. Yeah. So yeah. It just makes the floor space back. Yeah. Even processing small parts, Soul Stop has a small little uh, sliding adapter kit to put on their saws as well, too. Yes. So. Yep, yeah, and that 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 makes a nice feature, and a lot of guys do add that to theirs, which I have to ask them. I, I wonder if I think they might have that feature on there. Hi everyone, just want to take a quick break to let you know about our weekly inventory email blast. Our team machine is constantly adding both new and used inventory to our system. We alternate between a new email blast and a used email blast on a weekly basis. This week's email will feature a used SCM automated stacker, an RFS high frequency gluer, and many more pieces. If you are interested in receiving these emails, you can go to www.rtmachine.com, scroll to the bottom of our homepage, and enter your email address, or you can call us at 570-584-2002, or email us at sales at rtmachine.com, and just say, add me to your inventory update list. Now, back to the show. So then when somebody goes, next step would be a beam saw. Yep. And uh, so when when you go into the beam saws, we have uh, a few and different... By the way, Brian's talking all of this because he's used all these machines. Right <laughs> just, just everybody knows the rest of us just sell them. But. Yeah, I've been in pretty much on all of this stuff. And uh, from all the way to the top side on the, our shelling... Uh, rear load. Rear loaders, so... Yeah. Yeah, I know it well, too well. <laughs> <laughs> many hours, many hours under the belt on those things for sure. That's, yeah. but uh, yeah, when you when you when you're climbing between those, and then you start talking about higher production, uh, that's when we typically go into a horizontal beam saw. Which here recently we started working with Femal. Yeah, and Brian, you're really impressed with one of their. Uh, saws they have um it's a little bit it's not quite a table saw it's not quite a full one beam saw um yeah i'd call it really a, a hybrid you know and the price point on it is you know in that we're in that low 60s you know which we didn't touch on price on the other saws um because it is quite a wide array you know a vertical you're into uh like forty thousand you know, with uh, digital readouts and stuff on it, which is, yep. you know, in today's marketplace, it really isn't a bad number to be into. Right. You know, and then, you know, when you're sliding table saws, you're pretty much starting about in that uh, $18,000 range and then going until about twenty nine for like a uh, uh, automated fence. And then you're going to jump close to 40 for, you know, a fully programmable sliding table saw. So really when you're looking at a lot of the features... Um, mm -hmm. this hybrid of the Femal Concept 350. It actually is a beam saw in a more compact version. So it only takes up the same amount of space that the vertical panel saw takes up with just a little bit more on the, on the fixed side of the crosscut beam. So, and what that saw is capable of because it has its back fence, let's call it like any table saw, your back fence travel would be like 52 inches. <clears throat> which is kind of typical. So that's all that's taking up. So from the beam to the backside of that fence, you're in that, let's just call it 60 inches for round terms. And it has a drop away um, power, 
power back feed fence. So it has two arms that are actually that rotate. So when you're doing a larger panel and you're cutting up into that five foot range, it has a short stroke on it. And then when it calls for making cuts that are going to be, say, three or four inches wide up at the actual beam, they rotate and the arms stick up and able to keep it. And that's why you're able to reduce the back footprint of the saw and give yourself more of like a full on, hmm. you know, beam saw operation. Hmm. And then that, that for a beam saw actually has the, the arbor is tilting. So now you have the capabilities of the sliding table saw and it actually has a set of um, mitered arms that are off the side of it as well. So instead of having to like on a slider, turn the, the cross cut fences, we're going to call it yep. and, and put your, your panel in that way and then travel the saw through the blade. This you're just cutting, putting that on the angle of the fence and then the blade is the beam is coming down and clamping on that product. <clears throat> yep. So the beam actually coming down and clamping is securing the part and giving you a higher quality cut versus trying to push it through and having human air yes. pushing it and slipping. That's some of your benefits of having that beam clamp it. Correct. Yeah. And some of the other options you can do with that. So obviously it's, it's a step scoring system. So the blade actually travels through as a score blade and then it comes back through oh, and yeah. cuts as a full panel. If that's what you're calling for, you know, if you're running a melamine. So some of the other nice features you can do with that is, you know, uh, miter lock assembly is pretty popular today. Um, and instead of running that through like a shaper or a designated miter lock machine, you're able to put that in the beam saw, cut the 45, and then you can run the blade back through at the 45 and it actually puts a spline cut hmm. in that. So now you can put that miter together with a, with a biscuit or a spline within that so it's a pretty powerful saw when it comes to different features you can do with it <clears throat> so yeah we're pretty excited about it i think it's it's going to make a nice happy medium for those shops that are need to be able to step up production where you can still stack on that saw and uh, still give your capabilities of you know a sliding table saw and uh, especially somebody that's doing a lot of veneer products or or plastic laminates you know, instead of having to try to push those products through a table saw, now you're now you're in the being able to just clamp that in place and safety wise, it's much safer than a sliding table saw. It's much safer than a, yep a table saw. Yeah, absolutely. Because you know all the safety features that are on it, you can't even actually get your arm in the beam if you tried to put your arm underneath there and close the saw. It automatically kicks it back, so it wouldn't even operate. Hmm. So it's pretty much next to impossible to. To get in that saw and Let's hope so. yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah that's that's going to be a very interesting concept um moving forward i've been following that saw for quite a few years actually i think it was introduced back in uh about 2008 uh i think through the recession years it had trouble catching uh some traction and uh looked at it pretty heavy like in 2016 which it you know pretty much came to market and was actually uh, refined and, and done pretty well. And they've, they've kept the the electronics on the machine pretty straightforward, which um, we all know today with things going out of date. Yeah. You know, they, they've kept the, that part of it that you're not into such a brain box that, you know, is going to be obsolete and user friendliness. So it's really easy to operate. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Dean, you're supposed to hit that cough button. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. I'm still learning it's I, equipment. I have a bunch of... I, well, I forgot to call him Jamie. <laughs> Little Jamie. Jamie, pull that up. <laughs> Jamie, pull that up. They got a few customers that really excited to introduce the concept of this saw to that are running, that have a beam saw now that production may have fell off or pr production may have changed and it's not the main source of what they're running anymore but when that job does come by they still need some way to process material fast and with ease that could really use the space in their shop that that beam saw is taking up for some other equipment for some other processes maybe some material storage where this 
this concept of the saw is really interesting and be able to replace the beam saw that isn't being used day in and day out. Right. And, you know, the, as we were talking, you know, with the standard table saw in the shop, <clears throat> what this th machine is actually capable of is what we would call is a straight line rip. You know, instead of feeding the, feeding the material through it, it's clamping and running it. Right. Right. So in some of the demos, it's, um, we actually have a video of it running at, um, a three inch thick board. Okay. Sounds like a good piece. Yeah. Being able to put things in there on an angle and it's got lasers and everything in it. So it's already, uh, <laughs> work on that. <clears throat> yeah. So that, that takes us right into, um, the large, the large panel saws. Now we're jumping into, uh, you know, which from all we do have, uh, uh, a base saw coming from that concept into the, uh, horizontal beam saw that's going to be, um, give somebody that a little more production, uh, range for that. They have a couple of nice options. And then obviously we go into our workhorse, which is the shelling. Mm. And there's a few options on the shelling. So you're going to go from your starting out as your FH, uh, four models, FH five and FH six. And they basically are all on horsepower range and then, uh, rear loading capabilities. And then it's the sky's the limit there. So basically you're going into storage systems and everything else that we jump into on that side of things. What did you run at KI back in the day? We had an FH6 rear loader. <clears throat> so years Is ago we started 14 footer? 14 foot, yep. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, some of the nice capabilities that um, we just sold uh, Miller Blaker, a 14 foot saw, and they, they had a, a brand new shelling 10 footer beside the new 14 footer that we put in. And I was showing the operators um, how much more efficient you can be with the 14 foot saw. And he said, well, how could that be? Cause I'm only cutting an eight foot panel. I said, well, <clears throat> what you want to do is, so what they're primarily doing was, was taking their eight foot panel and putting it up against the fence, the back fence and the crosscut fence and operating everything right there. So now your pieces are like right in front of you. So the real way to keep your efficiencies up is to throw that panel all the way to the other as you're facing the saw to your right side of the saw. Now, as you're doing your rip cuts, you can take your, your, uh, rip cuts right into your cross cuts without having to take them actually off the machine because it's laying on the tables and you can go right into the operation. So your operator here is not fatigued with trying to move boards on and off the saw. Yeah. So that's really where, when you get, jump into that bigger capacity is what you're gaining. There is your operator fatigue as well. And just having that much more material on the table, yeah. you know, what you're doing. <clears throat> now, stepping up to like a beam saw, you're, I mean, it's a whole different level of saw. I mean, you're set up. I mean, Bree, how, how many days are we uh, quoting for a panel saw set up now? Mm -hmm. To set up a panel saw, I think we've been right around the 40 hour mark, give or take, depending on the size and status of purchase. Yep. So it's bringing it in, setting all your pieces in, leveling it, squaring it. Um, and just, uh, test running. I mean, it's taken, takes a little bit to get it all set up. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you gotta know what you're doing. We had a, it might've been before you were doing the scheduling, but we had a customer that asked us to come in and do training on a beam saw that they had already installed. And when we got there, it just would not would not work and the boys had to take it all the way back apart <laughs> we just recently had a customer they had us come in because they couldn't get it calibrated at all and i don't know what the problem ended up being kyle has not been in but they had to push it all the way past the sensor several times shut it off repeatedly until it magically chose to calibrate itself wow yeah <laughs> sounds like an interesting setup sounds like a machine <laughs> sounds like a machine yeah <laughs> Yeah, so definitely going uh, on the high side of it. Now you're into, now you're into full production that uh, you can pretty much outwork. Uh, when what we were running, uh, typically we would run stacking four to six panels, depending on the style of material we were running. And uh, one beam saw like that in FH6, you can outwork three or four CNCs, uh, and your cut quality is is really where it's at. <clears throat> That's always the big debate. You know, when you're getting into panel processing, um, between running nested base off of 
you know CNC routers to to the panel saws. But once you really get into most larger shops, um, we, we the panel processing side that we call it cut band drill is probably my favorite, only because of the accuracy is is where everything's at. <clears throat> And your tooling. Tooling's another thing. You're, you're going to get much longer tool life out of a saw blade over a router. Right. You know. Hmm. And then the panel saws will go all the way up to angular saws where you rip on one and transfer automatically to the second one and cross cut. We don't see a lot of that. That's in the big, big, big plants. Yeah. yeah. Almost a lights out facility. Right. But uh, yeah, it's pretty much the sky's the limit when you go to uh, the large beam saws. You know, it's, you're talking about you know, let's, uh, the female at their standard panel saw coming away from the concept, which is not a tilting arbor saw, you know, you're going to be in that, you know, hundred K range. And then when we jump up to the shellings, you know, we're, we're at 170 plus, you know, and it's not uncommon, you know, the saw we had, you know, today is a $300,000. Right. So <clears throat> now when do we typically see somebody going from just a standard operator load loaded saw to just say a rear load with a panel storage system behind it? What are we really gaining by doing that? Well, a lot of it is the, you know, the style of work you're doing. Um, you know, today, what, what a lot of it's called is rainbow stacking. Um, you know, where depending on how the jobs are coming through the facility, they might only be running, you know, 20 panels of one, but then they might be running five panels of another, might be running seven panels of another. And that's where we call it rainbow stacking. So where the storage system comes into play is you have all the colors that you are offering within your stack in the stacking system. And then it has a CNC vacuum system that actually goes and picks each material and stacks it per your production run. And then that feeds it into the conveyor and onto the panel saw or under the panel saw so it's quite sophisticated and when you're getting into something like that now you're talking million dollar setups yeah. you know between saw and and in uh, the inventory systems yeah and they'll, <clears> feed, <throat> they'll feed a saw a router the storage systems are yeah very... yeah and that's that's the big thing once you jump into a storage system you're like you just said the being able to feed multiple machines yeah. uh, at a time yeah and that's just because of sheer volume Correct. You just need some volume. Yeah. Well, and one thing you, you do realize as well um, that we've saw, you know, is, is going from uh, a CNC based panel processing <clears throat> over to a panel saw processing. Uh, the time, the saw is just incredibly fast, mm -hmm. you know, and the accuracy and the tooling. So that's usually the big thing. And, you know, I think uh, one of our customers, Northway, they do both. No. They have they have cells set up for their their CNC side of things, and then yeah. they have their their other cells set up as uh, sawing. Right. You know. And yeah, I think it's a nice setup down there. Yeah. So they they can bounce back and forth, and there's probably no perfect answer, you know, for it. But um, you know, one thing with a sawing operation is uh, much easier to put operators on. Maintenance is much easier to do as well. So when you get into the panel saw side of things. Hmm. <clears throat> so people from the cut band bore world will will know it right off the bat. But just to clarify, when we say beam saw and horizontal panel saw, we're talking about the same thing. Correct. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <clears throat> Anything that we're coming off, we're going to go from uh, a sawing operation right into an edge banding operation and then what we would call a, a type of drilling operation. So if you're putting line bore holes, construction bore, any of that type of stuff. <clears throat> so some of the some of the features that you'll see a lot of the big shops will struggle with as well, and even the small shops as well. Your tooling, um, the tooling is key to keeping everything accurate. You know that your edge quality and stuff is is what's going to uh, stay. Uh, what you would call it is uh, much more in tune through the day than in a compression style bit, you know, so the operator's got to be on deck a little bit more. Like what we ran on our flatbeds is my operator, because he knew wh about what amount of time he was running and how many panels and the thickness of the, the uh, board that we were processing. We would go, he would actually keep three tools on deck in the tool holder. So he might have just that 
that outside trimming tool, he might have it in tool one, two, and three. And as soon as he saw anything, he just hopped right to tool two and uh, without missing a beat. <clears throat> so he was already pretty set up for the day or the next day, you know, having enough tools on deck to right. keep that in place. Hmm. So and there's, there's always arguments back and forth of which way is better. <laughs> I think to, to get around that, and we'll probably talk about it on another episode, but that's <clears throat> one of the reasons that almost every industrial edge bander that comes into the States now has pre-milling on it. Correct. Because they've just decided that that edge is going to need prepped one way or the other. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that is one of the big things. I mean, we always push for pre-milling regardless just because if, if you're literally not coming from right from the saw right into the bander, you're going to get edge swell. You sure. Know, and that, that's what takes that away regardless if you're just nipping it or if you're calibrating it up to whatever edge band thickness you're, you're putting on. So it's definitely definitely the way to go for that <clears throat> all right we had uh well, what did we have on there we had the uh saw stop we had our north tech flim all yeah i think you're pretty much shelling in our our strebig the um and we kind of just did a quick run through of price ranges on all those but of course there's ridiculous slew of options that's like anything else if you want to spend money they'll there's, there's enough options <laughs> exactly yeah, so. yeah a lot of people would say you know what's the next step from your you know going into your drilling operation um and that's there's so many options so from the base side is is just going into a uh, standard line bore style machine that can do just line bore or construction bore if you decide to go into a dowling operation mm -hmm. um, to, I would say the next step would be like a feed through style machine, which are pretty popular today, uh, doing a lot of the drilling operations. <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, I, I was always a fan of the point to point machines as well, because for a very customized shop or millwork style shop, um, doing panel processing work with a lot of custom millwork style items or you know whatever it uh, lends itself pretty well because of the versatility of the machine <clears throat> you can pendulum operate within a within a uh, point to point machine you know running multiple parts back and forth so for a lot of different shops that do a lot of custom quick setups it's pretty nice because the board's already sized and uh, you're basically just doing it and doing small operations to it right. within there but then it gives you the capability of you know running any type of curvature part or anything you want to do or millwork part with uh, horizontal operations as well right so well, that's good well i think that's pretty much our saw stuff um you had a nice visit uh, this week with uh one of our customers up in new york there and canoes and stuff you were oh about, yeah you, you yeah. almost went out with one on your car <laughs> <laughs> yeah essex uh they do quite a bit with uh their their industry they do a lot of parts for the canoeing, but then they do uh, a bunch of different things for different industries, and they are w around the uh, intellectually challenged individuals. Yeah, uh, it's a it's a great operation. Um, They've been a customer for quite a few years of ours, and uh, we've sold them several machines. So I know you stopped up there. Yeah, the uh, the canoes are pretty pretty badass if i do say so <laughs> <laughs> the, the one i wanted actually uh isn't released yet it's a it's a royalties thing they're working on uh with that style but uh it's the hunting rig it just happened to be uh, ryan and i were talking about going duck hunting here and uh <laughs> oh that's why that came up <laughs> so, yeah. so trying to yeah, get he brian goes, well, let me show hunting. you something up on the upper rack here and he took me up there and it's uh you know a wider unit and it's uh they're going to set it up with uh, gun holders and it's got uh are oh, they going to actually make the canoes or they make the oh they parts. make them that no was, they, they okay. actually I are now he was doing parts that's what they were doing and now they're doing these full carbon oh yeah yeah they're pretty pretty wild Nice. And they're doing a printing, uh, the uh, carbon process. Um, the cloth that they're using is all different style prints hmm. and uh, really pretty awesome. You hmm. know, it's a good look to them. It gives it almost a real classic look, and it's super light. Like, their their small boats are like 15 pounds. Hmm. Um, so That's they're just, just unreal. Yeah. I mean, the, the wood part, of the, and they're, they're putting a lot of classical wood into it as well, just, you know, the top rails and things like that. So it's, it's uh, and uh, caning seats. Now they do, you know, stuff that's more sport as well with, with uh, nylon and stuff. But 
I like the stuff with the caned interiors and stuff. It looks pretty cool. Yeah, they got a nice batch of equipment. They got a Marine Johnson <coughs> ripsaw up there, and a, uh, yep, we 312 sold a, in there. A molder. Uh, yeah, Kent Wood. I think you're going to do a little service work on that or something. Yep. That's what I started to hear a little bit ago. Yeah, Nate. Mm -hmm. uh, we went over that with <laughs> Nate. So he's he's going to do some uh, bearings and stuff up there, and uh, we're actually we. We were going over one of their operations. It's a very narrow part that they make that's only about a half inch wide, but it's an um, inch and a half tall. So um, one of the issues they were having um, was feeding the part, and the part actually wanted to walk away from the cutter head a little bit. So <clears throat> we went over a couple things, and we designed a part that is going to fasten to the existing pusher fence and give them more stability right in there. So when they're running out of operation, they can just unbolt it and and pull that out when they're running their big stock and, and add that in there. And so that was a nice little project in itself, just yeah. walking through. They still run their on shrewd pin routers. Yeah. So <clears throat> they were going to rebuild the head on, on one of their units. And then we, they're running their on shrewd CNC, which is a five by 12 table. Yeah. And they have multiple fixtures for that <clears throat> with a lot of these uh, canoe parts that they run. They do, they do a stellar job. I mean, it's, really amazing it was good to see a nice clean shop too yeah it was very clean yeah really. like their cnc area and stuff was just like it was it was refreshing to yeah. see something that didn't have crap everywhere <laughs> <laughs> even their stacks coming in and out were like were like perfect it was, hmm. it was pretty yeah. nice and the the uh, workers and uh, being uh, mentally challenged they were all nice people i mean call them kids but they're not they're adults no. and, and uh, they work they work every time i've been there hard workers oh yeah they were yeah i was high fine some of the guys they were yeah they were good some of the girls were eyeing me up <laughs> 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 yeah it was, it was a nice time they're they're great people to deal with up there and yeah. uh, so it should be nice to uh see how the operation the canoe operation continues and uh, everything else my wife actually used to work for goodwill industries and she she was in the workshops at Goodwill um, hmm. with, with the uh, the students, and then she was in job placement as well. Mm -hmm. So she she helped uh, put them into the field, you know, pretty much like what they're doing up there. They had a lot more back in before COVID. A lot yeah. of the students wouldn't come back, or the workers wouldn't come back because of the COVID thing. So he's been struggling. Yeah, I mean, he just he had twenty two applicants, and they got two. And I said, that's actually really good because I was just at three other shops today and they didn't even get one to show up for interviews. So, right. um, so it's, it's, it's good to see that they're still moving forward pretty well with it and they have a great program, you know, with that. And, uh, so yeah, Essex industries. Yeah. So look them up and, uh, it's a great thing you can actually donate to their cause and, and help them out with, uh, different th products that they do. They do some pretty neat stuff with the whiskey barrels too. Well, they don't do that. Uh, well, they re they reconditioned the. Oh, uh, the, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. <clears throat> yeah, the old whiskey barrels that can't be used anymore. They do they get them from the place across the road there. Oh yeah, they yeah. had they was probably five dozen sitting there ready to mm. do redo the bands and they they prepped the out sides of them and. You know, they There's go a off warehouse the, across the street that does the Metallica one. Oh, it's the Metallica. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. Gino, Gino and I went over there and rolled the window down and listened to the music outside the warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> Explain what you're talking about. They, they serenade the whiskey with Metallica yeah. while it's aging. So it's aging, <laughs> it's aging in the barrels in a warehouse, and they play loud rock music, Metallica music uh, that... Uh, you supposedly know makes it better whiskey. That's probably why I listened to Metallica the whole way home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think of that. I was like, holy cow. It was like, yeah, I think my radio, they, like in that, that valley they, there you're at, it turned it automatically. They cha channeled you while you were in Mineville, New York. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's a beautiful country. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what that was. <laughs> yeah, it's right up there at the top of Lake George. I mean, at the top of Lake George. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, when I got back in the car and I was cruising out of the valley and then i hit uh 87 there i was like oh wow it's only a hundred miles yet to albany <laughs> <laughs> you realize how far you're up there that, that windy road from 87 over I, oh I, yeah I, I have a good time on that with my car so <laughs> as ron just put tires on his car again. <laughs> and now you're wondering so, now yeah. you know why <laughs> wondering why the tread was gone <laughs> yeah yeah next time around i get to gotta go to the low profile <laughs> I got the Jeep for the high country stuff. And <laughs> yeah. Maybe you'll, you'll Jill's over, over there shaking her head. You guys. Oh, Jill's in the room? Jill is in the room. <laughs> uh, 
Everybody should be introduced to Jill. Jill takes care of us very well. Jill, say hi. Say what's up, quick. Jill. Hi, guys. How's everybody doing? <laughs> Jill does not like microphones. <laughs> she is filling in for uh, Dean, and the, she's uh, showing her the the control board. Mm -hmm. So we're, and that's what Jill used to do. So she knows it. Yep. She knows how to do that. Just yeah. Everybody's going to be on a shoot tomorrow. So it's going to be uh, me and. Uh, Just be, well, if we do one tomorrow, it'll be you, yeah. me, and uh, and yeah. Eric from uh, Tars Draco, right? Yeah. So, so we'll see be. how that goes. <laughs> so it was a good show. Sawing and uh, anybody has any questions as always. <laughs> Ryan, what did you do this week? Anything good? I, I know you came in here for a customer today. That didn't go that well, but uh, we we're since planning to go since out. Since he didn't show up, <laughs> plan to go out and do some training on some sanding equipment with uh, one of our service techs and a customer. Um, for that, got moved around a little bit so we could run some demos on some planers, and that didn't quite go through. So it's been a hectic week. Yeah, customer had a little bit of an incident at the plant this morning, so they couldn't make it. So yeah. we'll, we'll do it another time. It happens. Yeah, yeah. it does. It mm -hmm. does. That's so good. Uh, it's a good Eric show. Eric was busy on his computer today. Did a little. Tried to buy some stuff. Only got one. Yeah. Yeah, we're keeping an eye on an auction sale today. Um, trying to pump up the used inventory, but <laughs> <laughs> apparently the economy's still good. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it was one of those sales that went right above what we wanted to pay. We were back better on quite a bit of stuff. Mm -hmm, true. But uh, they didn't have a great day, but neither did we. So That's always tomorrow. Yep, there'll mm -hmm. be another one. We got too much stuff anyway. Yeah. Guys, please buy used equipment. <laughs> the link's too full. <laughs> yeah, we need some room in here. Awesome. Well, it was a good show today. Yep. Appreciate everybody sitting in and till next week. If you need service. Yeah, give us a call. Option two. <laughs> Option two on <laughs> dialing in. Get your rate to Bree. Yeah. Thank you for sitting in for us a little bit, Bree. No, of course. Yeah. Jill, it was fun watching you be shy. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> we have some neat guests coming up here, and uh, stay tuned for uh, Joe Strauss with Hermance. He's yep. going to be on September 8th, so that's going to be... Uh, yeah. Formerly with Hermance. Formerly, Formerly with Hermance, yeah. yeah. So yeah, should be interesting. get our voice uh, viewers to tune in on that one. And Absolutely, should be looking very forward to it. Okay, till episode nine. If you plan to attend the Wood Pro Expo in Lancaster, PA, on October twelfth and thirteenth, don't forget to stop by and say hello. We'll be in booth five hundred three. Don't forget to support our buddies at Green Street Joinery by subscribing to the American Craftsman podcast and their new YouTube channel, Today's Craftsman. Both links in the description of today's podcast. <laughs>